What's going on, Digital Wildcatters? Welcome to another week of OGS. Got an interesting episode here, a company that I know nothing about, Omium. We have the CEO, Arnie, on the show. This is Portfolio Company of Energy Transition Ventures. So Neil uh, put us in uh, contact, said, hey, I've got a cool company that needs to come on the show. So why don't you tell me real quick what Omium is? I just made a comment right before we started recording that it's like, it's got something to do with electricity with the ohm in the name. Tell us what you guys are, what you do. You got it. So, um, Omium is a company making uh, electrolyzer equipment. Um, you know, I can tell you a little bit more about what kind, um, but the idea, of course, is to make hydrogen from electricity, and that's that's what got us uh, going with the name Omium. You know, we knew that uh, when we when we created the company a little more than two years ago. We knew we didn't really want to put hydrogen in the name, yeah. Um, you know, because still for for some people that that gets everyone thinking about certain airship, um, and and Omium was a was a pretty creative name from uh, one of my co-founders. It is it is funny how there's negative connotations with different energy sources, right? right. So hydrogen and um, that incident, and then also I believe that uh, millennials. Have negative connotations with nuclear energy because on the sim city computer game you'd always have nuclear meltdowns and so i think that's why people <laughs> hate nuclear energy <laughs> yeah and, and you know to just to make the connection there i i'm a physics guy but my first job out of school was as a as a navy submariner okay um so you know however you want to say it i do i glow in the dark uh, not as far as <laughs> not as far as i know but um i i think most people would say that i'm probably still somewhat recovering from you know, the very exciting experience. I loved it. Um, you know, I was only in the Navy for, uh, for about five and a half years on active duty. You know, f from my wife's point of view, it was a little too much going to sea. I thought so too, but my goodness, in terms of technology all in one place, you can't beat it. So, yeah. So, I mean, tell us a little bit about that first off, because mm. I'm interested in the life of a submariner. Life of a submariner? I, yeah. I can't, I can't imagine uh, yeah. being in a vessel underwater for any point in time, much less <clears throat> the amount of time a submariner does. Well, I had to be a little careful. I don't want to say anything that's disrespectful of other parts of the <laughs> of the service. Um, but we always figured that we had the hardest job. Um, we would compare ourselves to astronauts. Yeah. And like, let's look at it this way. An astronaut's working against what? One atmosphere of pressure. It can't be more than that. So, you know, if they punch a hole in their space shuttle or whatever, 15 PSI. Whereas on the other hand, for us, it was it was forty four psi every hundred feet. Yeah. So you know, we, we felt like that was something. Um, I we really did. I was on the Florida. Uh, the Florida in my day was a was a you know an SSBN, so a, you know a Trident missile submarine. Now the Florida still goes to sea, but it carries uh, Tomahawk missiles. It's an SSGN. It got converted. Okay. Um, it was actually uh, my uh, my captain. He's since passed away. But he wrote a, you know, people talk about writing white papers. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote a white paper. Hey, if there's going to be a treaty that reduces the number of uh, missiles, missile carrying boats out there at sea, why don't we take our old boats and take out the Trident missiles and put in something that looks, looks kind of like a six pack from a revolver, uh, put that in each of those missile tubes and make a, make a Tomahawk shooting submarine. And they did. Uh, <laughs> the first four Tridents uh, were converted. But, you know, in case you're wondering, you people probably heard things like if you put a piece of string across from one side of the hole to the other side of the hole and then you dive down deep, does the string really go slack because the hole gets smaller? Yeah. Yes, we did. True, one day, huh? we, one day we did do that. <laughs> I mean, it was you have to do that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So I worked uh, offshore rigs in the Gulf of Mexico and um, just being if I'd go in a crew boat, you know, these small boats. They put you down in the hole and I'd get so seasick just from being in a uh, two hour boat ride in one of those. And so to get out there. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe in a submarine, it's more, it's more stable underwater, no. but. Well, I, I would give you, I'd give you the yes and the no. So the yes, um, I can't think of a time I felt the boat move if we were down at 400 feet. Yeah. Um, but. It's round, right? <laughs> I mean, you 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 look at a cross section of, of of anybody's submarine these days, and it's it's a round thing. If we we're up on the surface, we'd be sloshing around. I remember one particular time, uh, we had a, a person who had appendicitis, oh, man. and so we needed to pull in, and and uh, just like in Hunt for Red October with the helicopter and the whole thing, and yeah. the, 
you know, the, the grounding rod to make sure there's no static, same thing. And, and off you went to the hospital. We were up under, under Alaska. Um, but at the same moment, there was an exercise where our job was to write down as many coded messages as we could. You know, that's part of what you do yeah. when you're, when you're part of the Navy that's, you know, got Trident missiles. Um, and of course, where's the radio room? It's not in the middle, it's at the top of the submarine and you're rolling back and forth and back and <laughs> forth and one by one, just as, you know, as, as you, you, you know, you, you, you don't up to having trouble. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get some saltine crackers. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to go lie down. The radio from, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then we go down for lunchtime and what is for lunch? Um, the most greasy kind. Some there are different kinds of hot dogs. Yeah, the greasy kind. <laughs> there's, a, there's a spectrum of hot yeah. dogs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's so interesting. So yeah. tell me, you know, you you do your service uh, in mm -hmm. the navy and yeah. a submarine, and then what after that? Because I want to kind of build up the yeah. story of how yeah. um, Omium came up came about. Yeah. After after I after I got out of the navy, I went and worked at IBM. I worked. Uh, I worked up in Vermont. Okay. Uh, I at the time when when uh, when I went to join there in the beginning of '96, uh, if I understand right, that was the largest semiconductor fab in the world. Now it was really two fabs, an older one and a newer one, kind of with hallways connecting, and it's still you know a very big big facility. Um, I went there as a process engineer. What is a you know you take a Navy submariner who knows how to move water around and keep the chemistry right for the reactor plant, you know. One thing for people like that to go and do is help out other people who have things that you know need real tight chemistry control. So I went and worked there, but I paid very close attention. This, you know, in hindsight, this was the beginning of when IBM worked very, very hard on patents mm -hmm. and intellectual property and things like that. And so I did my best to learn uh, from the people around me how all of that worked, um, and that set me up well so that then. Uh, you know, in, in the Y2K time, mm -hmm. uh, I made up my mind, I'm, I'm going to go back to working on energy. Uh, and so I, uh, I worked at Plug Power for okay. five years. Yep. That was where I, uh, that was where I had my first chance to really, uh, engage with hydrogen. Now I shouldn't, you know, did we have hydrogen on the submarine? Of course we did. Um, you know, i I think I've spent something like a year to a year and a half of, of my life underwater. Yeah. Um, and it's not like all that time my air came from an electrolyzer. My oxygen came from an electrolyzer because you know we'd 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 ventilate and pull you know pull down into the boat, kind of like snorkeling, pull down into the boat, breathing air. But if we were underwater for any decent amount of time, no, we'd turn on the oxygen generators. Mm -hmm. And the type that I used, uh, or, or the type that we had on the Florida, were older. Mm -hmm. um, since then, the submarine navies developed a, a new kind, working with. Uh, the technology that came out of GE um, and then was part of UTC that that went up into space. Okay, um, that's called PEM. Okay, um, PEM. You know, there's always you get into any technology sooner or later. There's an acronym, right? <laughs> um, PEM, especially, especially in energy. Energy yeah, professionals it, love acronyms. If you talk to the original folks, that again, I had a chance to meet them when I was at Plug Power. They tell you it's polymer electrolyte membrane. And, but PEM these days, most people use as proton exchange membrane. Okay. The way I'd explain it is, imagine you have thick saran wrap, you know, so at least you've got a visual. Yeah. And by thick, all I'm saying is you pull and try to stretch it, you're not going to tear it. It's very rugged. Yeah. Um, but you get it loaded with a very mild acid. And that's bonded inside the membrane. So it's not going to come out. You could get it wet, get it dry. That acid's not coming out. And weak acid like vinegar, um, it's actually sulfonic acid. So it, it's stuck in there. But then once you do that, now it's a proton conductor. Like, what do you mean proton conductor? Well, you know, I take a piece of copper. I can get electricity to go from one end to the other, right? It's an electron conductor. Well, this is a proton conductor. If I somehow got H on one side and and put some voltage on it, I could get H to come out the other side. And that's a weird thing to think about. But now if you say, okay, let's put water on the bottom, let's put some voltage on it, I'll make H come out the other side and the oxygen will be left in the water. And so from the Seawolf, you know, 
I was never on the Seawolf. Seawolf was way too cool of a submarine for me. <laughs> um, but from the Seawolf submarine on, that type of oxygen generator is what people go to sea with. Okay. Um, and that same type, you can imagine it in reverse. That's what originally kept the astronauts going on the Gemini around and around in orbit. And then there were other types of, of fuel cells. That's a fuel cell. You put oxygen on one side, put hydrogen on the other side, make water, get the electricity back, fuel cell. So yeah. you run it in one direction, it's an electrolyzer, makes hydrogen, makes oxygen, run it the other way, it's a fuel cell, you get your electricity back. Yeah. It all started from NASA, that same group of guys. So the, the person I learned this from at Plug Power, um, he had been the quality engineer when Gemini was going around and around in orbit. And, you know, I, you'd hear stories, you know, often these people are storytellers, yeah. right? And that's the best. Yeah. <laughs> um, you'd hear stories like, what was that like, Jim? You were in the control room? Yeah, I was, he was from Boston. So, you know, please imagine everything with a Boston Got accent. Yeah, the Boston yeah. accent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, and, and uh, what was that like? Well, you, can you imagine if you're flowing hydrogen and you're flowing oxygen, any gas, but it makes water? Well, what's going to happen? You're going to have water start building up in some of the little passages, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are the astronauts going around and around. And Jim's telling me, yeah, and the cells started flooding. Well, what's flooding? Well, in these older days, they didn't know what to do with the water when it would build up. And it would clog the channels. And then the voltage from the cell would crash. And you can imagine sitting in Houston here, right? It, this would have been a smaller version of Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. The voltage is dropping. Jim's sitting in the control room and he's telling him to burp the valves open a little bit, let some of the hydrogen or oxygen out into plastic bags. And the way he told it to me is, then we didn't know what to do because they're in orbit going around and around with the little with little bags floating in the capsule <laughs> of, of hydrogen and oxygen. What's going to happen when they land? And I always wondered, was was he just making that story up? But then I read, I think it was Jim Lovell's book, the maybe the Lost Moon book. But oh my goodness, there's the other half of the story. Um, and, and so that really did happen. But anyway, I learned all of the basics of this stuff from people like Jim when I was at Plug Power. Um, he was a fantastic guy. He passed away about 10 years ago. Um, and it worked on all those technologies. All of, the, all of the work to create electrolyzers and fuel cells goes all the way back to those GE days. Yeah. And, and many of those people aren't with us anymore. But of course, like anything, if you study and learn hard, you know, you study hard and learn well, I should say, you, you, know, you can pick up how the technology works and then help to move it forward. Yeah. Um, Jim then uh, convinced me that I should go and, and be part of what he was creating at Bloom Energy in California. Yeah. It was a very different technology. Um, but, you know, same opportunity to take, you know, electrochemistry and build systems that would work for people, you know, on, on planet Earth. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit of how I ended up uh, working on this about two years ago. You know, look, if we climb in a time machine and we go back to, you know, 2010 or whatever, you know, hey, is it a great idea to make, uh, make hydrogen from, uh, from electricity? Well, I don't know. What which electricity did you have in mind? You know, oh, electricity from from renewable energy. Mm, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Well, why not? Because it's gonna cost more than if you make it some other way. Yeah. And sure enough, in the world, you know, even even people wanting to use hydrogen in fuel cell generators, again on planet Earth, they're gonna put a little micro reformer. They're gonna take a a baby version of the steam methane reformer from an ammonia plant or a refinery, mm -hmm. and they're going to put that next to the fuel cell, and they're going to run it on natural gas. Yeah. But what's changed is now there's such affordable... I mean, if I have it right, Texas almost has more renewables than any other state now. Yeah, leading state for wind power generation. Right? Yeah. That's really changed things. Mm -hmm. And once you get to that point, hey, when there's, when there's a lot of abundant renewable energy, why not flip on these hydrogen generators. And if you haven't got some other great use for the electricity, take that hydrogen and steer it toward where it could go to work for you. Yeah. Um, nice thing about, uh, you know, again, if I, if I go back to my submarine days, we were very careful with the oxygen generator we had on the boat. You know, we'd very carefully ramp it up. We very carefully ramp it down. 
but that kind that they made for the Seawolf with the PEM membrane inside, you can just hammer it. Yeah. You know, slam it on, slam it off. And so now, oh, the puff of wind comes. I'm getting more out of my wind turbine. Not a problem. Make more hydrogen. Uh, I suddenly need electricity over there. I don't want to make hydrogen. Fine. Shut it down hard. And, and that's one of the nice things about the technology. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's really interesting. Uh, we had Redshift on the show prior, and we were talking about the same thing, kind of the um, accumulation of knowledge and skills that are built over generations and technology. So this is super fascinating for me to hear. You know, this goes all the way back to the NASA program generations ago, yep. decades ago. Yeah. And it's cool to see, you know, so much knowledge and bandwidth and brain power put into technology that gives you guys the opportunity to deploy and build new technology today. That's that's really cool. And it's cool to hear yep. the stories and the history of how that came to be. Yeah, no, and I mean, you figure it's what, 60 years later, right? I mean, I, I think of myself as young, but I'm starting to be one of the people who knows how it all came and got put <laughs> together. And it, I'll have to I'll have to admit, it feels a little weird. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, you know, it's absolutely a wonderful thing. And and without any doubt, if you imagine yourself in the position of the folks who made either the stuff that went in orbit for Gemini or the stuff that uh, was first on submarines, you know, did they have wonderful power electronics? Did they have, uh, you know, think of all the material science and things that we can do today, even the computer yeah. assets, right, yeah. to model things. No, I, I mean, uh, Jim would show me old uh, GE reports and bring things in from his garage. And these are typed reports. You know, if there's a graph, they, they made the graph by putting X's with a typewriter. You know, there was no Excel or, yeah. you know, none of that. There's a, there's this <laughs> meme that goes around on the internet about the Greeks and how they build, you know, this just, I mean, massive infrastructure and they're like, all right, let's build this, you know, let's build this, uh, this sewer system. And then you have engineers today and they're like, oh, my, auto, my AutoCAD <laughs> shut down. I can't, I can't build anything. <laughs> right, so right. I always respect, especially, you know, I've seen things, you know, from, uh, the, the, the code that was uh, printed out to put us on the moon. Yeah. I mean, we just did so much with such little uh, computing, uh, power. And so there's a lot of, and even in oil and gas, I mean, when I got in oil and gas 12 years ago, um, we still did a lot of things very, very manually that were kind of like, it was just kind of amazing. I mean, you're out there and you're like, hey, why are we not doing things with computers? But then there's also a level of respect for just the ability to do things without technology. Well, and, and I think I'm, you know, I, I feel pretty blessed. I, I learned a lot from each of my four grandparents. And and maybe as a, my parents were kind of, you know, liberal and letting me spend time with them. So, you know, maybe I'm lucky uh, in that way of realizing that there's a lot to be gained when I listen to you know, folks who might be in their seventies, like Jim, yeah. uh, as he's explaining, uh, things to me. Um, my, uh, my dad's, uh, my dad's father, uh, actually as a, as a rookie engineer physicist worked on the Manhattan project. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's and, cool. And, you know, and it's weird because I'd ask my family, well, what did, what did grandpa work on? Oh, he worked on camouflage for bomb casings. <laughs> now at the time I accepted it, but as I got older, I'm like, that's a weird thing to work on. Like who do, did anyone even really work on that? And it, one one uh, one summer, as I was driving home from from school, my grandparents had driven driven down and and uh, took me back home to Seattle. My grandfather, and this is this is 1988. My grandfather says, "Well, I guess I can tell you now. I worked on the uh, uranium separation for you know one of the two. Uh, uh, nuclear weapons that was that was dropped in World War II, and and sure enough, that's why when my dad was a little kid, the fam my family uh, his family had moved to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they took the stuff at Berkeley and scaled it up into big big separators. But I've learned that people people who are telling you what they did in their earlier in their life, I kind of try to put them into two buckets. One bucket of people who have an amazing memory. Jim was like that. If Jim told you, no, Arnie, if you're going to make it work, you have to make it this thick, this wide, this pressure, this temperature. If you didn't do that, <laughs> you're, you're asking for it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't work again, right? Yeah. Um, and then there are people, and I've met many, where they say, no, you shouldn't do it like that. You should do it like this. They may not remember exactly the details. But the theme of what they're saying is exactly spot on. And it's really, I think it's really important to understand 
which type of person you're working with so that you file the information the right way. The index information you know, with properly, Jim, yeah. You know, you take it to the bank and you're like, okay, Jim said it should be this wide and this thick. And so let's go make it this wide and this thick. Oh my goodness, it works. <laughs> Whereas with someone else, it's not that that information isn't just as valuable. It's more that, okay, what were the themes of what they just told me? And let me go put those themes to work. But let me go see if I can find someone like Jim to help me with some of the details. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So you essentially have the people that kind of give you parameters to work with. Yeah. And then people like Jim that's going to tell you yeah. the execution of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, you made a comment about Seattle. Is that home for yeah. you? Um, n- not anymore. Um, you know, I look, Seattle's a wonderful place yeah. for, for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I kind of, uh, you, you know, I'm sure you don't really like to get going with sports biases, but, yeah. <laughs> um, <Let's> you know, <laughs> I, I grew up, I grew up with not a lot of championship teams except yeah. for the Sonics, which then sadly don't exist anymore. Yeah. And, um, I'll confess to, uh, not really being able to get my head around liking most uh, most AFC West teams because that's where the Seahawks used to be. Yeah, I'm not used to this. I'm still not used <laughs> to the new Seahawks. Um, I I would cringe when I saw a Broncos uniform because yeah. I knew that that was John Elway and I knew that the Seahawks might be winning and then he would come back and win the game in the fourth quarter. Yeah. <laughs> um, same thing for the Raiders. Same thing for the Chargers. I just can't help it. Yes, yeah, so I um, uh, I lived south of Seattle in okay. my elementary years for. Us. Second to seventh grade, I lived okay. in uh, Puyallup. You lived in Puyallup? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Ah. And so uh, yeah, I was yeah. a big Sonics fan. I've got yeah. a basketball signed by Gary Payton. No and, kidding. Yeah. And so, okay. Um, yeah, I feel uh, some no, of the- Well, my relatives, I think, still figure the Oklahoma- uh, Oklahoma. They're State still there. Sonics. <laughs> they're, they're still, number one, they're still Sonics. And number two, they're still going to move back. <laughs> yeah. There's, <laughs> but, there's always that lingering hope. I love the Sonics. And so, yeah, um, yeah that's what I so thought. So then were you a Seahawks fan or you- you got uh, so no, that. I've always been diehard Dallas Cowboys fan. Dallas Cowboys I was fan. born in West Texas and got then uh, moved from Seattle back to West Texas. And so always, that's the death of me. So yeah, I'm, a, I, I'm a Cowboys fan. I, I, grew so. up, I grew up with the, you know, in the Steve Largent era Seahawks. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I, everything, you know, uh, I still have my Steve Largent jersey. My son has said, Dad, why do you keep that thing? But, <laughs> but, I, but, I, uh, but I still have it. Um, and so anyway, for me, when the Seahawks beat the Chargers in the Super Bowl, it, it, or sorry, it, it beat the Broncos yeah. in the Super Bowl, it really couldn't be any better. Yeah, that was like that, it was that like was an the, AFC that West was the pinnacle for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm I'm happy now. Yeah, uh, you know I, I'm I'm ready to support anybody. Yeah, you know I can always go watch that game. Yeah. <laughs> so does that was that the reason for going into the Navy? Was I mean because I spent a lot of time in Birmingham and at the the it, Naval Yards um, or it it I mean it, I had exposure to it. I had seen submarines in the water out in Hood Canal. Um, I had seen ships, but I went to school in LA at a place called Harvey Mudd College, okay. which is a kind of a really small version of of Caltech or okay. MIT. Um, I just, you know, for me, I didn't want to. I I saw a lot of sunny places on TV as a kid, and I wanted to live a less <laughs> in a less rainy place. Now I think I had a little bit of a crazy fantasy that I'd study physics and engineering and go to the beach. And that was that was poorly founded. I, <laughs> wasn't though, a good wasn't a good thesis. There was on no that. beach. There was there was plenty of si- the physics and, and engineering. Yeah. Um, and did hunt for Red October have a bearing on my thinking? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that was the influence. Yeah, I, I remember watching it, and then I really liked particle physics. And the more I thought about it, and like, well. What better place? And I think even today, if you want to understand reactor design theory and operation, what better place to get to know that than in the U.S. Nuclear Navy? So, yeah. I, so I did, and and it it was fantastic in that way. That's awesome. So let's talk about hydrogen a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's a really interesting space. Um, a lot of people in oil and gas are obviously interested in hydrogen. We've had some cool technologies on recently that are focused on hydrogen production. Mm. Um, you know, I love that you walked us through, you know, what an electrolyzer is and how it operates because that was my first question. It's like, what the hell is what's that? The, what, yeah. What's, <laughs> that, what's <laughs> that thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one, you know, coming from your background, 
know, there's a guy I know that's uh, very involved in the nuclear space. He came from nuclear submarines as well. Yeah. Um, why did your attention divert to hydrogen over nuclear? Um, do you think, uh, I'm kind of asking you some meta level questions here, but sure, sure, I sure. mean, do you think hydrogen is more viable as energy source for uh, humans than nuclear is over the next 20 to 30 years? What's your opinion on that? Well, let's look at it this way. Um, I mean, first of all, um, you know, uh, in case my mom's listening, I'll apologize now. But when I explain this to my mom, I always start with, think of hydrogen this way, mom. What if, what if I could make hydrogen at a cost equivalent of $2 a gallon compared to gasoline or diesel? Would that make you happy? Yeah. Yeah. That, that cost me less than the gasoline you know, which would be for her to mm -hmm. put in her car or diesel if you needed that for your car or your truck. Um, I think that's the first bridge for people to cross. Does it mean that that's where you're going to put uh, that's where you're going to put the hydrogen? No, it doesn't mean that. But it's an easy thing for us all to visualize to and think about yeah. in terms of cost and value. Like, what can I do with a kilogram of hydrogen? It's weird. You know, we don't. You know, you can't put it conveniently in a in a in a one gallon uh, gas can the way my dad would do for his for, you know five gallon gas can for his Jeep. You can't mm -hmm. do that. Um, so then, where are the good uses for hydrogen? Well, um, do you do you need hydrogen to make steel? Well, you don't need it, but you can use it. Uh, can you use coal? Yes. Can you use natural gas? Yes. Oil? Yes. But you can use hydrogen. Um, and when you take a look at decarbonization as one way to one way to think of hydrogen, ten percent of the world's carbon is coming from making steel. Okay, well that's interesting because it had nothing to do with nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Nuclear power, you know, like we could say to ourselves, the best way to make electricity for people is with solar panels. Okay, we still have to make steel. And somehow you're going to need to get all the way over to making the steel. Now, are there groups of people who are like, no problem, I'm going to make this reactor. It'll be very cool. I'm going to go straight from iron ore to steel. Absolutely. But can you retrofit existing steel plants that way? No, that's tricky. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it could be solar panels. It could be wind turbines. It could yeah. be nuclear power with big steam turbines. Yeah. Any of those can go and make the electricity to make the hydrogen to go off and make the steel because here's a convenient here's a convenient part of the whole energy problem people you know the whole whether it's the duck curve or the dragon curve whether we like it or not we're going to get up in the morning we're going to have breakfast we're going to go to work mm -hmm. we're going to come home we're going to want it to be cooler in our houses because it heated up during the daytime we're going to turn stuff on and eventually we're going to bed that's not going to change i mean we might all work the you know it might be like Arnie was in when he's in his early Navy nuke days going to the night shift at the prototype reactor. Sorry about uh, that, Sheriff. No you worries. hit that lever, it'll drop. <laughs> it scares you when it happens. No worries. <laughs> um, you know, one way or another, we're going to have that, right? Yeah. And so, what do you do if you have renewables that are either out of sync with how people want to use the energy or nuclear reactors? You know, you could you could go grab us in the engine room and say, would you rather cycle the plant up and down a whole bunch? Or would you rather just run this nuclear reactor flatlined? Yeah. Yeah, we'd rather run it flatlined. Less yeah. can go wrong. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point. Um, you know, when you look at hydrogen, especially feedstock in the build in the production of materials, that's a uh, that's a really good point instead of just uh, power power generation, but actually using it like, hey, we can use this to build steel. Steel. Um, you can take a look at uh, you know, no matter what. You, you would say about what's going on in Europe with, uh, with Russia and so forth. Mm -hmm. The reality is they've shut their ammonia plants down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And what's that going to do? Well, you know, again, uh, you, can, you can get groups of people that say it's not such a great thing to use ammonia as a fertilizer. It's hard on the soil long term. However, I think you can get another group of people that'll say without ammonia, how do you feed the planet? Yeah. And we just shut down the ammonia plants in Europe. So- you know, yeah. And, it, and uh, it's scary too. I mean, when you see what's happening with uh, fertilizer prices and the right? second order effects that that has on food production, I mean, it's scary stuff. It's scary stuff. Yeah. So so then you could say, well, okay, 
Uh, I can make ammonia in Europe using renewables or nuclear reactors, whatever you want. I'm going to make hydrogen. I'm going to connect it with the nitrogen. Off we go. I don't need any natural gas to flow from Russia. But you could also say uh, in in Texas, I'll take uh, you know I'll take the abundant renewables. I'll go and make the very same ammonia and I'll ship it over. And I'm like, well, why would you do that instead of using natural gas, which we have in the United States, and mm-hmm. making ammonia? Well, of course you can do that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, you've got this abundance of energy when the renewables are out of sync with people. Yeah. Put it to work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's been, you know, we're heavily involved in the Bitcoin mining space, and that's another area. It's another like, area. hey, if you can utilize abundant energy when it's not needed by humans, take that energy and convert it into something of value. And so it sounds yeah. like there's a common theme here with hydrogen production as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm getting here in the last week, I'm getting a hydrogen production 101 <laughs> masterclass between huh. y'all and Redshift and, you know, Redshift's using uh, plasma technology to dissociate H2S, but they're u- using electricity and yeah. running across to yeah. uh, uh, facilitate that process. And so, uh, for them as well, the big input is, hey, what's your electricity cost? And if you can get three cent electricity here in Texas, three cent per kilowatt hour, um, you know, they're able to generate, I think they said the target, correct me, you probably know, but f- by the feds is a dollar yeah. um, per, is it, how's it measured? How is Well, hydrogen? often per kilogram. Yeah, that's what I was say, per yeah. kilo. So yeah. dollar per kilo, and they're like, you know, we can be way under that as long as you have yeah. access to cheap electricity. So for uh, Omium, it sounds like it's the same thing. It's like the big input is we need the cheapest available electricity price in our as our, as our input. That's probably what's going to drive um, economics. Is that... Is that yeah, correct? I mean, when you look at it, there's no question that the input energy matters. Uh, you want you want this thing you've made that converts electricity into hydrogen. You want it to be efficient. Um, you also want it to be you know dense. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't want to need uh, ten football fields to make the hydrogen you had in mind. Um, and you want to be able to install it and scale it quickly. You know, you wouldn't want it where yeah, we'll have that ready in fifty years. I yeah. mean, these are these are real opportunities and also real problems, right? Mm-hmm. In, you know, today. So all those factors are going to feed in. And you know, my perspective on all this, and you know, in case you're wondering, is is this a is this a one solution comes and dominates? No, it's it's never going to be like that. It'll never be like that. It'll yeah. never be 100%. like that. Just yeah. like, a, hey, how about the the people working really hard on on biogas type solutions? Isn't that important? Of course, that's important too. Right. The thing about energy production is that it's very much driven by geography, right? And yeah. what's the best solution for that area yeah. and what resources do you have available? And so this is what I tell a lot of people is that there is no one solution that solves all the problems. Um, it's very much different technologies and different energy sources to get yeah. the energy reliability and uh, mix that we need. So yeah. I agree with you on that 100%. Yeah. Talk to me about commercial viability mm-hmm. of this technology um, in terms of scale, sure, um, sure. you know, how, I don't know what an electrolyzer looks like, you know, I have no mental image of, yeah. you know, how big these things are, um, you know, how, how much electricity, um, you know, is 50 megawatts of electricity, the, the max that can be handled, you know, what are your parameters on there? How much hydrogen can produce, can be produced? Can you kind of give me some idea of how big this can be, or even how, how little, small, yeah, how small it can scale down to. <clears throat> well, I think that you know, let me let me kind of come at it backwards. Um, when you make when you make these cells, whether they're battery cells or fuel cells or electrolyzer cells, uh, it's a little different than when we go at making a turbine. When you go at making a turbine, you know, the way I always understood it is you've got a lot of thermodynamics that are saying that if you make it bigger. You're going to be able to manage your your losses in a more efficient way, and uh, you know I always remember this thing called Carnot efficiency. Okay, uh, where this Carnot guy figured out I can calculate based on how hot your hot thing is and how cold your cold thing is. I can calculate an efficiency, and you will never do better than that. I always found that a bit fascinating. Um, and so you know, in a turbine, to get closer and closer and closer to good old Carnot's efficiency, they tend to get bigger and more complicated. Um, in a, a simple way to look at that, 
The reactor plant on a submarine, which is smaller, ours was about, you know, what, 200 megawatts or so, was less efficient than the reactor plant on an aircraft carrier, which is two gigawatts. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So then when you move into the world of cells, the physics and so on don't say that. You know, the equation that says what the little voltage in and everything for each individual cell, size never comes into it. So I could make one, uh, you know, the size of a of a pin. I can make one the size of your, your nice table here. Doesn't matter. So then you get into, well, what's the easiest to make? Because easy often sounds like cost effective <laughs> and commercialization, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Well, could we make one the size of the table? We could, but if I do that, I'm going to have more challenges in really scaling it up. So, you know, what's what's one of our omium philosophies is let's make it on a people scale. Mm -hmm. Let's make it out of parts that, you know, can I pick them up? Yes. Will I have a robot pick them up? Sure. But I want to be able to pick them up because then I know I can use normal logistics in, in factories, in service situations and so on to move parts in and out. Yeah. And now I come to the first part of your question. Imagine a double wide refrigerator. I fill that up with electronics. Why? Because all these little cells, they need DC power, right? They, they don't like AC power. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's a photovoltaic cell, battery cell, fuel cell, DC power. So I'm going to condition the power that's coming from wherever we want it, you know, the, the nice renewables in Texas, or it could even be the nuclear reactor. It doesn't matter. I'm going to condition that power. I'm going to create the exact DC voltage I want. And, you know, I'd call that power electronics because it's giving me the power and it's electronic, right? Yeah. So that's in one double wide refrigerator. And in the other double wide refrigerator, what have I got? The stack of cells, just like on the Seawolf submarine, but I'm going to make them out of parts that are a lot more cost effective to deliver and commercialize. And then I've got a couple other jobs to do to really make hydrogen for somebody, right? One, I've got to circulate water around and around. That stack of cells is useless unless I deliver water to it. And the second is the hydrogen from all these things like we were talking about, it's going to come out a little humid, kind of like a very hot day. You know, what's the humidity of the hydrogen that comes out of any of these hydrogen generators? Ah, eh, pretty close to 100%. So you're going to just simply pull the water back out of it. You can keep that water, yeah. make more hydrogen with it. Yeah. But you don't, you know, nobody wants... You know, you think about any place you've ever worked with pressurized gases. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants water in the pressurized gas. not good for valves, tanks, et cetera. So yeah. you're going to take that water out. Um, that, for us, when we're, when we're delivering units today, uh, would be about a third of a megawatt okay. of, of, uh, of energy in this, this, this combo of two double-wide refrigerators. Now, what's the strategy then? You know, are you telling me it's never going to be bigger than a third of a megawatt? Well, first of all, two things. One, you know, the ones we'll ship in a, in a year or so will be more than that. They'll be closer to half a megawatt. Oh, okay, so that's our technology roadmap, right? Why can we do that? Because this thing's very much like an electrical device. You can, just like people talk about Moore's law with chips, right? Mm -hmm. We can keep getting more and more and more function out of the same space. The second thing is you're simply then going to line those up. But we're not going to line those up. Again, you can imagine a football field with a big array like solar panels, cabinet, 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 cabinet of these double wide refrigerators. Yeah. But the nice thing is you can also stack vertically. As I said, they're probably pretty modular to where they can be stacked up as well. Stack them vertically. So, you have to you have to engineer that carefully, but then all of a sudden you've got a very dense solution. So yeah. you know, can you make a, a one gigawatt installation that's pumping all the hydrogen needed for an ammonia plant? You can. Mm -hmm. Can you also make one the size of a pin so that if you had a had a need for hydrogen that was really, really small, you could do that? Yes, you could, but we're going to focus in an area that's more like this third of a megawatt, half a megawatt. Why? Because it's a little bit of funny math. Um, in an electrolyzer, you think about the energy going in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what's – when people say megawatts, how much electricity from that energy source goes in. Yeah. We don't tend to talk much about the hydrogen coming out. We can, but the units don't stick for people, so it doesn't tend to be the way people talk about it. In generators, you talk about the energy coming out. Yeah. And so on an on a net basis, you know, when you think of losses as you kind of flow down the value chain, 
300, uh, 300 kilowatts, a third of a megawatt going in, half a megawatt going in, that's not too different from the energy level or power plant in a car, truck, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So then it means we can put this together with parts and technology that are more or less automotive and we're ready to go to scale. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even when I asked you about it, I asked about you know how much electricity mm -hmm. going in. So yeah. it's interesting that you framed it like that because yeah. we ask how much electricity is going in. Going when in. we talk about generators, we talk about how much electricity coming is out. coming out. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. So tell me a little about, I mean, you guys are targeting, you know, a uh, third to half a megawatt market. Yeah. Is this going to be, it sounds like you guys are looking at places that have um, extra renewable uh, energy capacity. I mean, where do you see your go-to-market mm -hmm. strategy? Mm -hmm. What type of customers or companies, assets are you guys looking for? Yeah, I, I think it kind of breaks down into uh, um a continuum, um, but what's fascinating is that the continuum is is uh, compressing in time, um, and, and maybe I, I could describe it this way: um, two years ago, everyone had it in their in their mind that the way it'll go is hydrogen will go first to the people who buy hydrogen today, and it's expensive for them. Um, an example of that is people who make things made out of glass. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't think about it much, but there's hydrogen going into a glass factory and not a lot uh, megawatts of hydrogen going into a glass factory. And maybe that's the first industry that's important to convert. Um, and then over time, you'll see as the hydrogen becomes more and more cost effective, which of course is going to also track, as you commented, the, the three cent per kilowatt hour renewables, what if then it gets to two cents? Mm -hmm. What if then it gets to a cent and a half, right? As you start coming down like that, you start picking off industry after industry as they become cost effective. And it makes sense for the people who are running those businesses to say, yeah, that's interesting to me. Um, and so it often was, you know, then will come uh, putting hydrogen of that type into refineries, then ammonia production, and then lastly, steel production and things like that. But what I'm seeing instead is it's compressing in time. It used to be, don't talk to me about steel until it's 2026 or 2030 or something like that. It's compressing in time. The economics of these things are working much earlier uh, than, than everyone had considered two years ago. And so that's, that's I think, important uh, and also exciting, mm -hmm. but it's also telling us that the world's really grappling with some tough problems, right? I mean, it's yeah. not like, did we really want to wake up to where we are today? Probably not. Yeah. Just the same, this is where we are. So, you know, for us, then it's okay. Uh, uh, you know, whoever we're speaking to, here's our proposal for, you know, 100, 500, 1000 megawatts for a steel plant and ammonia plant. But it doesn't mean we don't also want to go and help the people who have a glass factory, right? Yeah. And when you when you design it with these little double wide refrigerator type cabinets, for us it doesn't matter. We're going to design to make the same thing. Yeah. Right. The other axis that's that's fascinating to think about is, you know, hey, which is going to win, hydrogen cars or electric cars? Well, how about let's not have that debate, right? Electric cars work. Uh, cars working on diesel and gasoline work. They all work. It's all about what's cost effective for you made a nice comment about uh, the the geography, right? Mm -hmm. If I live in a place where I have a long distance to drive, maybe there's not an electric car ready for me yet. Yeah. And so maybe what I need is a is a, a diesel truck where the diesel is made, you know, from the most cost effective way. Or maybe what I need is a hydrogen truck, right? Yeah. Who I love knows? that you brought that up because I have arguments with people on Twitter about this all the time. I'm bullish on electric vehicles. I think that they're great products. Yeah. Um, but it's funny to hear some people's bias in the way that they talk about those because they've never been down to Houston, Texas, where you have a two hour commute across a the city. They're like, oh, you don't have to worry about range anxiety. Right. I'm like, actually, I kind of yes, do. do. Yeah. yeah. Or, or in, in, and, you know, I think any, any mega city to get from one side to the other, if there's traffic, um, you might be looking at range anxiety or just straight up, I can't get there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you're so, yeah. You're, but you're just stalled out there. Yeah. My take would be, you know, the world will solve that. We'll all choose the right vehicle for where we live. Yeah. But crossing the ocean is another matter. Um, uh, on the Florida, we'd carry enough diesel so that if something went wrong with the reactor and we had to shut it down, we could get back across the Pacific on the diesel engine 
at a really slow speed on the surface with people getting seasick, right? Yeah. That's a lot of energy to be able to store. How does an airplane do that? Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure there are very smart people that are thinking about, no, I know. I'm going to make an, an even cooler, you know, you'll hear about people that have ideas around graph oil batteries and, you know, mm -hmm. various carbon tricks, but those aren't exactly ready today. Yeah. And, you know, listen to Airbus. We're going to run, we're going to run a great big, uh, wide body jet on hydrogen by 2025. Yeah. That's around the corner. Yeah. And with hydrogen, can you, can you store that much energy? You can. Yeah. You know, it's, it, hydrogen is an amazing energy carrier. That's why they put it into space. Yeah. Um, so I think then it, it it starts to look like the extremes that matter. Can, crossing the ocean, crossing the ocean, you're going to want to moan. You know, how do you cross the ocean if you said to yourself, "I didn't have any oil today"? Yeah. Okay, hydrogen is a good way. Ammonia is a good form of hydrogen. It's a good way. Um, and then you start thinking of other problems like. How do I store up enough energy to power a city through a really bad storm? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, I think long haul transportation, especially on, uh, freight vessels and airplanes is such a challenging problem that a lot of people can't comprehend. I mean, one, you look at freight, it's one of the biggest emitters of, yeah. um, CO2 and there's not a great, I don't know, uh, Neil, I got you over here in the background. Did you see this uh, VC portfolio company that had the sale? They had these giant sails on a right? freight ship. Right? I'm like, right? seems pretty regressive. We're going back to sailboats uh, yeah. across, across the ocean. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the good news is that, you know, most freighters, I and mean, we used to, we used to keep track of them on sonar as they're, yeah. as they're, as they're going from, you know, the West coast of the U S to Asia or vice versa. They're only they're only poking along at you know 13, 15 knots, and so you know if if you can use some wind energy to help you get there, it's not all bad. Yeah. The problem is, what do you do when you get into port? <laughs> um, and the the other fascinating thing I learned when talking to some uh, some Disney folks uh, about their cruise liners is they pull into port, they do not shut the ship down. I'm like, why not? Why wouldn't you? I mean, on the submarine, that's the first, you know, we yeah. all want to get off the boat and go home, right? The first thing we do is, okay, let's shut down the reactor and let's all go home. Um, they would not do that. They keep they keep some amount of the ship running about 10% to run all the air conditioning. Why do you do that? Because if we didn't, it'd get moldy inside. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. never thought of that problem. Yeah. So, you know, your comment about, about you know, ships and freight, it's, a, it's an important one. It is, yeah. And... You know, another point I wanted to bring up too, just talking about these industrial plants that are building materials, you know, there's, and there's just so much happening in the world right now. And it all comes back to energy, a lot of it, but you start looking at energy and shipping and logistics. And I mean, they're so commingled with each other and you're seeing a major shift in manufacturing that, you know, a lot of people think that, Hey, manufacturing is going to move out of China. You're going to have hotspots like Mexico, even the United States is going to get back to manufacturing. Some people have a thesis that you're going to have more co-location between energy sources and manufacturing, manufacturing plants that they're going to move closer to the source of energy. Right. And that's pretty fascinating to think about in terms of hydrogen yeah. pro uh, uh, production, because if you look at West Texas, have you ever been out to West Texas before? Mm -hmm. All right. So I grew up in West Texas and it is flat desert. There's no water, no mountains, no grass, no trees. But what is it really fucking good for? It's really good for producing energy. But That's right. Whether it's oil, gas, wind, solar. I mean, it can, do it. it can do it all. Um, and so you look at the potential for that to become a manufacturing hub because you have direct access to cheap electricity. And then um, you start co-locating the plants with energy. And then you start introducing uh, yeah. technologies like yours to produce hydrogen as feedstock into those those materials. I mean, that's well, a pretty cool future to well, think about. Well, look at look at where you and I spent some time in the Pacific Northwest. Why was Boeing so successful in the Pacific Northwest? Why did Alcoa end up in the Pacific Northwest? Because there was low cost hydroelectric power. Yeah. So you know now you know you just you just told the same story, but you you uh, you predicted the future, right? Yeah. Let's put low cost power. Uh, in, and make it abundant in West Texas, Texas, sounds like a great place to make aluminum. Sounds like a great place to do lots of things, which certainly, you know, does making hydrogen fit in there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think you're quite right. And, yeah. and, and you can see how, um, 
that make that makes a lot of exciting opportunity for manufacturing to move back to places in the U.S. where maybe it hasn't been before. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's actually really fascinating. I've never. Th- sat and thought about why is Boeing up in Seattle. Well, that's, I mean, what, that's what I always heard in school. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it makes, that makes perfect sense um, yeah. to think about With that. A, I mean, you know, good low cost aluminum. Yeah, you know, I, I just remember always driving past Boeing as a kid. And for me, it was nothing more than just a place where they made airplanes. But yeah. now that I think about it, it's like, why would you make airplanes up in- In the, where it's rainy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but that's a great example. I'm gonna go dig into that a little bit more because that's uh, actually a pretty uh, fascinating thing to think about. And um, yeah, this is one, um, this has just been great education on electrolyzers and hydrogen and Seattle Seahawks and uh, <laughs> a multitude oh, of other things. Wonderful. I, the, I, yeah. and I know we're going to have to talk again soon because I'm sure we could talk for a few hours on all of these things. But if someone is listening to the podcast today, we have tons of energy professionals um, across a wide array of uh, different assets. If they want to learn more about Omium, uh, where can they find y'all? Do you have a website up? Yep. The uh, web- website is uh, uh, omium.com o-h-m-i-u-m all right cool easy enough so guys yeah. if you want to check out omium we'll leave a link in the uh, show notes i'm sure you can find arnie on there too great guy uh super interesting guy um from what you can tell from this podcast pretty cool to see his uh journey into uh building omium and deploying this technology so i appreciate you coming on the show thanks very much this was fun